Well, now I'll turn it over to the audience for questions, and I'm sure there'll be many. Uh, we'll start first with this lady here. Uh, please open up. Uh -huh. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Sally. Welcome. Uh, what do you know of uh, regarding the violence in the media? And, and there's plenty on radio, especially. Uh, what has other countries who who we might have copied in that regard been doing of, about curtailing it? As you mean the portrayal of violence and yes, yeah. I mean, like the the independents being called traitors, as as well as other. Yeah accusations that are and, and violent language and yeah, violent yeah, language. Yeah. look uh, I don't know enough about uh, the the media in enough other countries to really have an informed view but I share your concern I, I think it's a joke for example that if one or two leading members of the opposition stand up at a doorstop and compare someone with Colonel Gaddafi that that automatically gets saturation media coverage now that is ludicrous because it, it is simply a throwaway line of no content, of no substance. It, it tells you nothing about the merit of their criticism of a minister or the government, but it's just a cheap way of, in effect, throwing a tantrum and getting attention. And what you do, sadly, um, was unable to stay. One of the great things that Greg inserted into public debate five or six years ago, maybe seven years ago, was the importance of civility in public discourse being able to disagree with people but treat them with some degree of respect and not start calling them Colonel Gaddafi or Adolf Hitler or whatever. So I think avoiding that kind of violence of language and that extreme language is very, very important. The trouble is, though, it's got an arms race dimension, is that if the signals you get from the media are compare someone with Colonel Gaddafi and you'll get a run, talk in a considered, moderate, civil way and we'll ignore you, the end result is... People compare their opponents with Colonel Gaddafi. So it, there is a real trap that's hard to break out of. Simon Marks Isaacs, what countries do you think do manage a, both a civil and a high level political debate? Look, very interesting question. Again, I'm probably not qualified enough to. Uh, to express a, a firm view, you know, and it, it's actually a hard thing to to compare because, by definition, I know quite a lot about Australia and not a great deal about most other countries. Britain's fascinating because Britain has the best and the worst media in the world in the same country. Like an example of violence of language: there's a newspaper called the Daily Star in the UK. I was there quite a long time ago. Now it's probably 15 years or so ago, and its editorials usually are three sentences and they have this heavy black underlining under them just to make sure you kind of notice the words. And in this editorial about the European Union, there was the, the concluding sentence of the three was, the only good Hun is a dead Hun. Oh, a, did I just read that in a newspaper? Um, you know, so that's kind of the UK, but at the other end, the Times, the Independent, the Guardian, with their various angles, whatever, superb quality media, the BBC, uh, and so on, and you can get... And, and both major political parties and the Lib Dems, there is a depth and quality of interest in issues and debate about issues that we haven't got in this country. Uh, so you've kind of got both extremes in the UK. The US, uh, I think, is enormously varied because it's really five or six different countries kind of bolted together and so the dynamics vary considerably. Uh, Europe, one of the sad things about Australia is that we, in our media, have endless reprints and reruns of the media in English-speaking countries. How much do we see of the German media, the French media, the Swedish media, the South African media even? We get a little bit of that, but that's predominantly English language. But we don't even get much of the Canadian media. So, in part, it's hard to know. Um, I remember reading a biography of Neville Rand many years ago, and back in the 70s he was perform having to perform stunts in order to get media attention. The great reform era of my life was from Bob Hawke through to about 2000 when the GST was introduced. And all through that time I don't recall the media as being especially uh, incisive in their analysis. A big difference of that era, though, at least Hawke and Keating was, they were much better 
communicators than uh, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard have been of the reform agenda. And on the other side, they had more responsible oppositions. They don't have a, a leader of the opposition who says, all economists don't know what they're doing. The, new, the middle class are the new poor. Um, you know, to me, the, the fault doesn't lie with the media. It lies with the particular individuals we're seeing at, at, uh, leading, leading at the uh, political level. Look, it, one of the problems with debating these things is that it's not a physics experiment. There's no kind of you know, absolute rights and wrongs. And so you know, I lived through that era in a sense that that era of the 1980s was my political coming of age, you know, where I you know, be became somebody of minor consequence. I was on a state administrative committee. I became a union secretary, so forth. So you know, I, I can compare it. I was uh, up to a point, but from different angles. Uh, I think it is palpable that the depth of the media then compared with now has changed. I think, for example, you know, the classic example is those commercial TV current affairs shows. You used to have Mike Willisey doing, you know, who was it who pinged John Hewson about the GST in 1993, my first election? Mike Willisey on a current affair. Now, they wouldn't have an interview of a politician of that kind, you know, at all now. So. I think there is palpable evidence that there has been a shift, and I think, I think in a sense you've kind of hit the nail on the head. Around 2000, although these things, you know, you don't swing from serious to vaudeville overnight, I think around 2000 is about the time when you get a, a very substantial change. But I do concede it's not the only factor. The professionalisation of political parties uh, and the loss of life experience, diversity of life experience in the parliament, I think, is, a, is an element. I think prolonged prosperity is a serious factor. I think one of the things that enabled Paul Keating and Bob Howard, uh, John Howard, um, uh, and <laughs> sorry, let me now. What was their names again? Uh, Paul Keating, Bob Hawke, and John Howard to succeed in that era was a widespread sense that things were wrong. You know that, that even though a lot of the reforms they were promoting were unpopular, there was a widespread acceptance in the community of you know things are crook. The economy's not working, we've got high unemployment or we've got serious inflation or this problem, that problem, uh, we've got antiquated economic structure. Yes, we need serious reform. And I don't kind of like what you're proposing, but hey, what would I know? So, you know, all right, I might go along with it. Uh, so the context was very different. But as I said, you know, we've probably got slightly different views on these things, but I can no more prove that my view is right than I can prove or prove yours is wrong or vice versa, because these are matters of perception and opinion. Um, Adam Johnson. Um, Mr Tanner, what, 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 what's your response to the idea that, I mean, equally my observation of um, people like John Howard and Bob Hawke and Paul Keating was that they were also far more willing than the current leadership to actually work the media. I mean, it, it was regular to see John Howard in a radio station, uh, you know, working through each and every one of them on a regular basis. I mean, it was, you hard pressed not to see him in a radio station once a day. I don't see the same level of commitment to actually explaining uh, things from uh, the current government or its predecessor in Kevin Rudd. Look, again, uh these things are questions of perception and I, I suppose you'd actually have to do the research and tot up kind of hours and so forth. But the other thing that's a variable here is the nature of the outlet. So by definition you can't compare going on, you know, an FM golden oldies rock music station and bantering about how you used to love Pink Floyd or something. Uh, you can't compare that with a serious interview on AM, uh, for example. So. Um, pretty hard to measure these things. Look, from the inside of the Rudd-Gillard government, it didn't feel like that. It felt like the focus on trying to deal with the media was ever present. And keep in mind that the world's changed. So uh, although this started to occur in the latter part of Howard's period, the emergence of things like Sky News, you know, pay TV generally, the internet, all these other kind of outlets, that's also changed the game, but it makes it very difficult to compare. And how good or bad people were or are as salespeople, one of the difficulties with that comparison is that you're kind of comparing, it's, it's a bit like 
saying, well, would Don Bradman have got a game in the Australian Test side? Um, you know, it's it's kind of like, well, yeah, probably would have, but you know, he'd be a bit old. Um, you know, so it's uh, it's it's a comparison that's very difficult to take to a meaningful meaningful conclusion. Cheers. Um, he spoke a lot about complacency. Um, as a young person, there's rather a lot of apathy um, towards politics um, for a lot of my peers. Um, and in that sort of atmosphere, the appearance of leaders actually comes quite, becomes quite important when it comes to voting. Um, I was wondering what you think, it's a bit of a chicken, egg, chicken or egg debate, but what extent the media is just a reflection of the audience or whether the media is preaching to the audience? Look, I think there's a significant amount of that and uh, it, it does you know, it does become difficult to dissect all those things, but uh, I think that that is an important angle to remember is that these are commercial organisations selling products, and by definition they try to be as responsive as possible to consumer demand. Uh, and I do think, but again, you know, I'm you know, somebody of a different age might have a different perspective, but I do think that one of the key reasons that we had, in my view, a more serious and substantial political discourse in the 80s was because there was a widespread sense of things are wrong. You know, the, the Banana Republic crisis, the dollar plunging to 47 cents, the recession in 90, 91, uh, these kind of things, there was a widespread sense of, uh, you know, Australia's heading in the wrong direction, needs a bit of serious surgery, that was beyond just the political insiders or, you know, the educated, politically aware minority. Uh, and so the absence of that, I think, does create amongst a lot of people a sense of, well, politics, you know, a bit inconsequential, a bit boring, my life's okay, or the things I'm on about are not really affected by politics. Uh, and there's, none of us can do much about that, and we should be grateful for it. <laughs> we, you know, it's the, the opposite of living in interesting times. Living in boring times probably means you're doing all right. So it's not a problem that you can solve, but it's a significant factor, I suspect. Just on the topic of voters, I might just ask a follow-up question myself. Um, have you given any thought to the issue of compulsory voting and how much of a problem or otherwise that might be in Australia? Yeah, I did. It's been interesting because I, I touched this and uh, I, I kind of hung myself out there and said, well, look, I've had a lifelong commitment to compulsory voting for one reason, which is that ultimately it does guarantee that whoever the government is has got some degree of legitimacy and endorsement from roughly half the population. And that's a very important thing. And in countries like the US and the UK where you're routinely getting people elected to power who in effect have got about 25% or even less of the voting age population voting for them, to me that's pretty undesirable and uh, corrosive of legitimacy. But I am now starting to waver because what I fear is that if you end up in a point where government is effectively being decided by things like what Tony Abbott looks like in Speedos, then the, the, the meaningfulness of that legitimacy disappears. Uh, so I, I haven't quite abandoned ship yet, and that's why I said I've hung myself out there by saying, look, I'm now starting to question. Uh, you know, for the time being, I'd say, no, stick with compulsory voting. But whereas in the past it was a no-brainer for me, I'd now say I think it's a debatable question. Uh, and I think I'm sure people here are well versed in the, the pros and cons of this argument, but I think one of the preconditions of compulsory voting being valuable is that the people actually voting have some, however basic, shared understanding of what they're voting about and what choices they're making and what decisions they're collectively making. And as that starts to diminish, then I start to question whether this institution is worth retaining. Okay, we'll just have two more short questions. Uh, this man here, and then the man in front of the Oh, yes, the yeah. um, I'd like to follow on from the question that the gentleman in the row in front of me um, raised. I mean, you're speaking about a dumbed-down media. Is that because it's catering to a dumbed-down audience? And has that got something to do with our education system, which is producing that dumbed-down audience? Look, uh, I don't think so, 
And in fact, one of the great paradoxes here, which I think does tell you something uh, that that should shatter the arrogance of people with high levels of education that you sometimes get from some of those people, uh, is that we are simultaneously in a society where the proportion of people with fairly high levels of education is steadily growing, but the public discourse, which superficially you'd think would probably grow in quality and depth with that, is actually heading the other direction. So. One thing that does is, in my view, shatter the notion that somehow the, there is a connection between those two things. Uh, so I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't draw a connection between them uh, and... Look, I, again, I, I, I can give you some vague idea of what life was like in the classroom circa 1970. Um, and I can tell you a bit about what life is like in the year one classroom at Tilden Primary School <laughs> at the moment, but I'd, you know, I'd be very wary of generalising about what's going on in schools today. I've, every now and then you know, I've seen snapshots of things and I've been surprised at the depth and perspective and, and quality, but then I see kind of horror stories of other stuff. So on that front, I'm not sure what to think. I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer, but I'm genuinely not sure what to think. And I'm nervous about generalising from what is a very limited exposure to the, the facts on the ground. I don't think there's any question our education system could be improved. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt about that, but I think the underlying factors that are the key drivers of performance are very complex, and we've had years of, from both sides of the political spectrum, or both sides of the argument, years of kind of u butte sort of often quite superficial fixes that uh, are not necessarily totally wrong but kind of sometimes miss the point a bit. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with your suggestion. I'm just not in a position to say, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. Okay, one final question from the man just in front. Just here. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, you've brought together a lot of, you know, the anger and feelings that I've had about who to blame about what's going on. But do you have or can you identify, let's say, a 10-point plan on how you turn this around? <laughs> um, ten, yeah, well, 10 commandments would be even better. The, look, I, I think one of the things that I was very cautious of, I, the final chapter in the book is essentially exploring that question, and I'm the first to admit that it's a bit unsatisfying because there's certainly no 10-point plan. There's not even a three-point plan, so it doesn't even get the first base. Uh, and part of the reason which I, I think particularly an audience brought together by this organisation would appreciate is that in this area more than anywhere else we should be extremely sceptical of government action. So we should be extremely nervous about any government coming along and saying we have a problem with our media and we are here to help. Um, I'm sure you could all imagine the possibilities that would eventuate. There are I think some small things that governments can do and they already do do that are kind of helpful. But, uh, like, I'm a big fan of community broadcasting, community radio, for example, particularly in regional Australia. It's, you know, it, it's not a dominant thing, but it's a very useful thing. Governments of either persuasion have subsidised that to a tune of six or seven million dollars a year for quite a long time. I think it'd be a good thing to increase that. Now, I don't think that threatens freedom of speech. I don't think it's sort of excessive government intervention or whatever. But that's a pretty limited, modest thing that's not going to dramatically change things. I think market forces are starting to gather and I actually think and I'm in a good position to observe this because my seat was lost to the Greens at the last election. I would have lost it in retrospect had I recontested. I didn't believe that at the time but in retrospect that's what would have happened and so I'm, I'm very well versed in the things that have been driving that increase in the Green vote and in my view the primary driver, not the entire driver, the primary driver is a gang of people who are politically aware and educated and progressive without necessarily being green zealots saying we're sick of being talked to like children <coughs> and although we don't necessarily think the greens are fantastic and they're a bit wacky on a few things at least they're talking about serious things uh, and i think that was a big driver in the increase in their vote where it'll go from here i don't know so i think that's an early sign that market forces are starting to swing back a bit. What I've tried to do with the book is just nudge that along a bit 
and, and in a sense make people a bit more aware in the hope that politicians, journalists, proprietors, editors, producers, while they're making these endless day in day out decisions, there's this little nagging little person sitting on their shoulder going, hmm, that's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? You know, and so just exerting a tiny bit of subconscious influence on things. Now obviously that's not just going to be me, it requires a lot wider kind of sense of public momentum than just anything that I could do. But I am hopeful that market forces will help to push back, hopefully without serious crises, economic collapses, dramas, disasters, sort of suddenly persuading everybody that, hey, it's serious, we better pay attention. Uh, hopefully none of those things will occur. I'd stick with compulsory voting, but like I said, I think that's far more debatable than what it once was. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, consumers, and there are a lot of people who are who feel like you've just expressed. There's a lot of them. I'd like to think that as they start, that starts to influence their behaviour, it will ultimately create a positive force that has an impact in the marketplace. I know that's an unsatisfying response, but I can tell you, if you went through the government action list, you, you, your hair would curl and your eyes would roll, and you'd kind of go, oh, "I think I'll stick with the status quo." Thank you very much. Uh, so that's that's the awful dilemma about it, is that this problem is less susceptible to any kind of government-driven response than virtually any other you can think of. There are very good reasons why you would not want any government to start thinking, oh, there's a problem here, we've got to do all these things to fix it. 